discover your spiritual identity with Bible teacher and best-selling author, Mike Shreve. There are hundreds of names and titles God has given His people that reveal who you are in Christ. Knowing these biblical names empowers you to claim your God-given inheritance and fulfill your purpose in this world. Get ready for a spiritual awakening that will cause you to boldly declare, I am who God says I am. Now, here's Mike Shreve. We're going to focus on a name for God's people that I believe expresses the highest privilege of a believer. We are referred to as true worshipers, and you're going to find out this is challenging. Where do I discover that name for God's people? In a conversation that Jesus had with the woman at the well. Let's go there. John chapter 4, verse 23. Jesus said, The hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. Well, there's two or three mysteries that come to my mind immediately when I read that single verse. Number one, when I go to church or a prayer meeting or a Bible study, I have the mindset that I'm going there to seek God. But the amazing thing that this verse reveals is that God is there seeking us. He's seeking true worshipers, those that will minister to him and commune with him in the way that he desires. The other thing that really strikes me and gets my attention is the way Jesus started the statement. He said, the hour is coming and now is. Well, those two phrases sound contradictory. Either it's coming or it already is. And I believe that was from his perspective as God in a human body on the earth. He was aware of the past, present, and future simultaneously. And so he said, the hour is coming futuristically but now is. In other words, from a heavenly perspective, it's as good as done. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, which would be the ultimate climactic outcome of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, ascension into heaven, and sending the Holy Spirit back. The whole plan involved bringing forth true worshipers in the earth. Praise God, this is so important. Let's go all the way back to the beginning of the conversation where Jesus talks to this woman as she's walking up to the well. He says, give me to drink. She said, how is it that you, being a Jew, would ask drink of me, who am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans? Part of the reason was because they held to a lot of false doctrines that were contradictions of the Torah and what Jews believed was a correct worldview. And there was a rift between those two people groups for that and other reasons. Well, that's not what amazes me. I'm not so amazed that a Jew would speak to a Samaritan. But what amazes me is that the God of heaven visited earth in the form of his son, and he did not go to the master theologians or the great political or social leaders in that place when he came to Samaria, but he chose a little humble woman to communicate mysteries to, some of which he had not yet even shared with his chief disciples. He said, give me to drink. Think of that. He didn't need what she had to give. He's the one that brought forth the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, every major ocean in the world, all the rivers, the, uh, the Euphrates River, the Mississippi River, all the lakes, all the ponds, all the bodies of water, all the rain that comes down from heaven and all the mist that rises from the earth. It all came out of him in the beginning because the scripture clearly says, all things were made by him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. So he didn't need her little bucket of water, but he wanted to see her response. And in like manner, he doesn't really need your little bucket of worship. 
nor does he need my little bucket of worship. He's surrounded with an ocean of adoration in the heavenly world now. Multitudes of angels and archangels and cherubim and seraphim and heavenly beings constantly worship him. What if my voice was missing? Would it matter that much? It would matter to him greatly because he desires you to be connected with him in the deepest way possible, in the most intimate way spiritually that is possible. So she said, how is it that you, being a Jew, would give, ask drink of me, who am a woman of Samaria? And listen to how Jesus responded. He said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says unto you, give me to drink, you would ask of him and he would give you living water. So the gift of God is the indwelling of living water that brings you into a worshipful communion with God. That's a gift. It's not religion. It's a relationship that you can only acquire through Jesus. He said, if you knew the gift of God, and if you knew who it was who says to you, give me to drink, you would ask of him instead. And listen, we need to realize Jesus was more than a teacher. He was more than just another rabbi. He was more than the son of man. He was the son of God. He was deity. He was the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He was the son of righteousness who arose with healing in his wings. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And when you realize who he is, he said automatically, you will start asking for the things that only he can provide. And so he said, you'd ask me for living water. Well, what is this thing he called living water? I believe that the natural mirrors the spiritual. And in this symbolic analogy, we can look at natural water and get a picture of what spiritual water or living water is. He's talking about a spiritual thirst quenching influence that he can give to us that we can drink of. And so let's go back to the makeup of natural water. Of course, everyone knows it's made of two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen, two gases combined together to make a liquid, which is a mystery scientifically. So it's hydrogen and oxygen fused together and they need each other in order to become water. Well, in like manner, living water is made of two elements also. I call it word to spirit, two parts word, uh, Old Testament and New Testament, and one part spirit, the Holy Spirit that inspired both Old and New Testament writers. And when you get the word and the spirit merged together, it quenches the thirst of mankind for a reuniting, a reunification with God. The word alone is insufficient because the word alone leads to formalism and a lot of intellectualism, and the spirit alone is insufficient because that can lead to fanaticism. But when you get the word and the spirit together, you can drink deeply of the presence of God in your life. Now, continue with me in this awesome conversation. The woman said, sir, you have no vessel and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob that drank of this well and his cattle and his children? I call that the understatement of the millennium. Are you greater than our father Jacob? She didn't realize yet that he was the one who wrestled with Jacob all night long and changed his name to Israel. So he was definitely greater than Jacob. And then Jesus answered this way. He said, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. What a beautiful picture. Automatically, my mind is gripped with the realization that first, the water, the living water of God flows into us but it doesn't just collect in us like a cistern. 
it flows into us and then changes its circuit and flows back out of us like a fountain of living waters. Well, where is it going and what's it doing? It's flowing out of us back to God in the form of worship and flowing out to others as we express the word and the spirit to the lost of this world, to those that are groping through darkness and stumbling through life, trying to find a way. And, and they're so thirsty, they feel they're about to die of thirst spiritually. We can extend the word and the spirit to them. So once the living waters of God's presence and God's word flow into you, automatically they should start flowing out of you that same way and become a well of water springing up how far? Springing up through time all the way into eternity. What a beautiful, beautiful picture. And then Jesus, of course, went on to say uh, that the Father is searching for true worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, I want to prove to you more effectively that the Word and the Spirit make up this thing called living water. It's not just revealed by the symbol. It's revealed clearly in Scripture as well. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 and 26. That's where it clearly shows that the Word of God is symbolized as water. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of of water by the word. So the word of God is clearly identified as having a water-like nature. And then also in John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39, listen to what Jesus said. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart or innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Again, notice that the water comes into you first to satisfy your thirst, and it flows out of you as it continues its journey. So out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Notice that's in the plural, not the singular. It's not just one river. It's a river that will meet every need, all of them merged together. A river of joy, a river of peace, a river of wisdom, a river of knowledge, a river of power, a river of authority. All these individual rivers flowing out of you that make up one huge river of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. That scripture proves, among others, that until the coming of the new covenant, until the day of Pentecost when the church was born, individual believers in Yahweh, in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did not have the continual day by day indwelling of the presence of God. There were times every now and then where the Spirit of God moved on them, but the Spirit of God did not dwell in people until after Jesus shed his blood on the cross, providing redemption for the human race so that we could become clean vessels for God to dwell in. So what happens is salvation. Actually, God empowers us to be true worshipers because he gives us a new spirit. Let me go to a prophecy from the Old Testament of Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27, that show how God qualifies us to be those who worship in spirit. He said, and this is concerning the new covenant, thus saith the Lord, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Now, that's what God did in the new covenant on the day of Pentecost when the disciples were gathered in the upper room. The Holy Spirit came in the upper room like a rushing mighty wind, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and immediately they were born again. They were regenerated, regenerated. Camp on that word for just a minute. It means that God generated in them a brand new spirit. 
And in order to worship God in the spirit, you have to have that regenerated spirit. Because prior to salvation, human beings are dead in trespasses and sins. What does that mean? Well, it's found in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are dead in our sins. That doesn't mean absolute death. It means relative to what Adam and Eve had in the beginning, that a a, a portion of us is non-functional because of the fall. See, man is a triune being made up of body and soul and spirit. The body is triune, made up of flesh, bones, and blood. The soul is also triune made up of functions like mind, will, and emotions. Every human being has a functional soul, although the mind, the will, and the emotions are very dysfunctional at times prior to getting this encounter with God. But the spirit is almost completely non-functional because the spirit's functions are, number one, communion with God, number two, revelation from God, and number three, conscience. And so, in a fallen state, communion with God is cut off. No longer can you get to God just because you make up your mind to do so. A lot of people use all kinds of approaches that always fall flat and, and, and always end up unable to bridge the gap because only God can bridge the gap between heaven and earth. And so we have all these religions that claim to be able to usher you into supernatural encounters, but it's never the true and the living God because you have to go through the cross for that experience to be granted to you from God. So the spirit is brand new in you when you're born again. The spirit is now quickened and functional in the area of communion with God. And you can also receive revelation from God. Your conscience is purged from dead works to serve the living God. So now a new part of you kicks into gear, so to speak. And that's when you start really functioning as a human being the way you should. Well, I know now how to worship in spirit. How do I worship in truth? There's actually seven ways that you and I fulfill the calling to be true worshipers who worship in the truth. And I'll elaborate on more of these after I read the whole list. First, it's in honesty. We worship him in sincerity. Number two, we worship him comprehending his word. That's number three. We worship him by applying that word to our lives. That's number four. We worship him knowing the right revelation of God's nature, character, and name. That's number five. We worship him by using right methods. That's number six. And we worship him solely because of our position in Christ, the one who said, I am the truth. Now, let's go through all of those in a little bit more detail. If we're going to be true worshipers, number one, we have to worship God with honesty. I love the statement that David made when he wrote Psalm 51, the psalm that he wrote after he fell into the terrible sins of adultery and murder, and he repented of what he had done and came back to God, and he said, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgression. He said, for I acknowledge my sin. It is ever before me. He didn't try to candy coat anything. He didn't try and hide his errors. He was honest with God. Number two is sincere. That means you're authentic with God. You're real with God. Not only are you honest, but you're real in your depth of desire for him. It's not a religious show. It's not trying to coerce God into doing something for you so you put on like you're doing something for him. You're authentically in love with God. Then number three, to be a true worshiper means you comprehend God's word. You comprehend God's word, especially in the areas that deal with what is necessary in the new covenant to be right with God. To be a true worshiper, you have to understand the correct approach to God. And then next, number four, you become a true worshiper by applying the word of God to your life. You may not be shouting hallelujah, but if you apply the word of God to your life, 
and you refrain from drunkenness, you refrain from immorality, you refrain from dishonesty, you refrain from various sins and errors in your life that are, uh, that are clearly shown in God's Word to be wrong, that's an act of worship because you're worshiping in truth. You're applying the truth to your life, and that covers a lot of territory. Next, it also involves, number five, the revelation of God's true nature. See, I was a worshiper of God before I became a Christian. I was a teacher of yoga at four universities in 1970. I had 300 students following my teachings who thought I was their guru. I ran a yoga ashram. I spent 12 to 14 hours a day in a monastic kind of existence, totally alone, doing meditation, praying according to Hindu practices. I would chant mantras sometimes for hours at a time, trying to achieve this place of God consciousness. I told God so often, I love you, God. I worship you. I want to know you. I want to be one with you. I was a worshiper of God, but I could not be a true worshiper yet because I didn't understand God's nature. See, I, I embraced ideas out of Hinduism that believe on an ultimate level. God is an impersonal life force called Brahman. And out of this cosmic level of energy and consciousness, uh, there's come forth, according to the traditional number, 330 million gods and goddesses to be worshipped. I couldn't worship God as a true worshiper because I had a complete wrong revelation of his nature. I didn't understand that he was the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that these three are one. That's why you can have millions of Muslim worshipers that think deeply that they are worshiping God in a receivable way, and yet they deny the de deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. They deny that he was God manifested in the flesh. To them, God is utterly one, and the worst of sins that you can commit is to assign divinity to anything or anyone other than Allah. And so there's a, a block between them and God when they worship because they don't understand the right revelation of his nature. Thank God for the day when I found out who Jesus was, that he has been everlastingly and will be everlastingly the image of the everlasting God. Number six, to be a true worshiper, you've got to use right methods. And there are certain methods that work. I mentioned one that I used wrongly when I was involved in yoga so many decades ago. I would chant for hours when Jesus said, use not vain repetitions like the heathen do. Sometimes in the contemplative prayer movement, they use biblical words and repeat them over and over and over again in order to reach a thoughtless state. So mystical experiences can be had, but uh, that's a wrong method. To be a true worshiper, you enter God's gates with thanksgiving, you enter his courts with praise. You lift holy hands, you shout unto God with a loud voice, clap your hands all you people, he said. The Bible is very clear about how God wants to be worshiped. And also finally, to be a true worshiper, we must realize that we are worshiping in Christ, the one who said, I am the truth. If we're going to worship in truth, then we abide in the one under the headship of the one who said, I am the truth, because we are only accepted in the Father's presence because we're identified with him. We're accepted in the beloved. And those are marvelous things to learn and uh, marvelous things to apply to our life. Now I want to study the word worship. There are some beautiful thoughts that I'm going to convey to you. Number one, what does the word worship come from? It comes from an old English word, worthship, that means the quality or state of being worthy. It means the quality of worthiness. Well, uh, no man can claim that. I've read in the book of Revelation where John wept much because no man in heaven was found worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals. No man on earth was found worthy. No man under the earth was found worthy. And then all of heaven erupted with the statement, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive glory and honor and praise and thanksgiving and dominion and power. Praise God. Only Jesus 
is worthy. And so the very essence of the word worship is a proclamation of his worthiness. When I say I worship you, God, in essence, I'm saying I declare that only you are worthy of adoration and none other. Now, when you go back to the original languages of the Bible, it gets really deep and beautiful. The main Hebrew word translated worship is shakal, and it means to fall prostrate. So whenever you say, I worship you, God, in essence, in your spirit, in your heart of hearts, you're saying, I fall prostrate before you in submission and surrender. The main Greek word translated worship is proskuneo, which means to kiss the hand. So every time you say, I worship you, Lord, in a sense you're saying, I kiss your hand, Lord. And how much more beautiful that is when we realize that hand was nail scarred for us. And in a sense, we're making the pain he endured even more endurable, if you will, because he purchased unto himself those who could commune with him in worship the way he desired. Let's go to a couple of other Greek words like latruyo. It's rendered into the word worship, but it's also translated serve in Philippians 3.3. 3. So when you say, I worship you, God, in a way you're saying, God, I am your servant. I am a slave to your purposes. Whatever you would have me to do, let me do it. I love the next Greek word is sebamai. It means to be stricken with awe in Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9. So again, when I say, I worship you, Lord, it's like I'm saying, I am so filled with awe. I am awestruck at your majesty, your omnipotence, your omniscience, your omnipresence, the greatness of who you are. And then finally, in Acts 17, 25, the Greek word therapuo is translated worship. How curious that is, because that's the word from which we get our word therapeutic or therapy. And it's all also translated heal and cure. When I first found that out, I thought, that's so strange. God doesn't need to be cured or healed. And then God spoke to me and said, yes, but when we worship, when we worship God, that's the key for us being cured, for us being healed of all the pain and the damage we've received here below. So when I go into a worship service and start lifting my hands and praising God and glorifying God, I say, this is my therapy. <laughs> this is how I recover from all the misery of life and the battles of life and the temptations of life. I'm a true worshiper and I'm going to lift holy hands without wrath and without doubt, just like the scripture says. Praise God. Let's do that. By lifting holy hands to him, we can cast our doubts away. We can cast our wrath and anger and unforgiveness away and just connect with him. What a powerful truth. Seeing ourselves as God sees us. You can go deeper into this revelation by getting Mike Shreve's book titled, Who Am I? Dynamic Declarations of Who You Are in Christ. We invite you to visit our ministry website, shreveministries.org, and our comparative religion website, thetruelight.net, where you can download a free ebook of Mike Shreve's testimony titled, The Highest Adventure, Encountering God. Check out our publishing website also, deeperrevelationbooks.org. Sign up to receive our emails, subscribe to our podcasts, and join a community of believers who boldly declare, I am who God says I am. 